Good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode three of the Biodiversity Podcast by Teasels. And in episode three, I am talking with uh, John Little of the Grass Roof Company. Hi, John. How are you doing? Hello. 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 Hi. Good stuff. John, so um, do you want to give us a bit of an introduction uh, to yourself and yeah, a bit of an introduction to yourself, what you do within our industry? Um, and uh, yeah, what you've been working on recently? Uh, yeah, I suppose uh, I've uh, I've always uh, messed around with plants um, from a very young age, uh, and then uh, after dabbling in retail for a while, I fell into uh, doing what I'm doing now uh, about 23 years ago, I guess. Um, and um, uh, I suppose I'd always been interested in the wild side of things and, and certainly been fiddling around with wild plants early on. Uh, and uh, in 95, we were lucky enough to build our own green roof house. Very lucky to be able to do that. And that started off a whole process of thinking, well, what, you know, why, why, is there, why, why don't people put plants on roofs? Why is there not more green roofs? Because there wasn't very many at that time. Hmm. Um, and, and then, so, so the plant thing sort of evolved into an into a infrastructure thing, really, and, and, and how you can use plants within buildings and, and in, 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 in urban areas. Um, so, and then I blundered around doing, you know, laying lawns and, and faffing around in, in domestic gardens. And then uh, eventually, um, a teacher, teacher friend of mine asked me to do some work in a school. And that was a kind of tipping point, really, because then we were able to try all the sustainable stuff, all the brownfieldy stuff, all the kind of green, you know, we were able to try what we wanted. We weren't restricted by a domestic garden. Um, so that was a big, that was a big difference for us. And that was really good. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, that, that, that was great. And then, and then of course, as time's gone on and we've kept building green roof buildings and we've kept pushing the biodiversity side, which gradually become more fashionable, I guess. So life's got, life's got slightly easier as time's gone on. And um, certainly at the moment, in the last couple of years especially, um, the work we've been doing with uh, talking about soils and substrates and, and uh, all the potential of designing with uh, soils and construction waste in a, in a you know, mimicking brownfield and mimicking open mosaic habitat. That's, there's a lot of interest now, the last, especially the last year. Um, which is great. And, and I think that whole area really opens up landscaping into a whole new world. As soon as you dump the topsoil, things really yeah. get lively. So that's kind of, that's my, that's, that's certainly good. And, in, and obviously in between all that, we've looked after a social housing estate in Hackney for 18 years, um, which again was another amazing opportunity and uh, a really beautiful thing to do um, and, and a privilege to do. So yeah, it's a mixed bag of all that, but it's all, it's all been in and around plants and slightly more, you know, slightly more natural um, landscaping, I guess. Excellent. So let's, so you mentioned brownfield, you mentioned topsoils. Let's, let's dive into that actually in the first instance, because, um, you know, we've talked on this, about this on many occasions. So for people, for the uninitiated, when you say, a brownfield landscape, you know, for, for landscape architects out there, for developers out there, what, what, does, what does that mean to them? So if you give a bit of a description. Yeah. Well, I guess, to be fair, a brownfield landscape is a very, it's an incredibly general term. Now, I mean, brownfield is, I was, assumed, I was associated with an abandoned, and, you know, a, a site that's been occupied or used by us in some way. It may well be an industrial site or it could well be, a, a, you know, uh, an old quarry. Uh, they're basically where we've just gone in, done some stuff, and then left it alone. And I think what makes it so good um, is is the variety, isn't it? That's so us, our process of building stuff, stuff falling down, um, going into disrepair. You know, we're leaving piles of rubble. With you know, all these processes of. of in fact, the man-made sort of processes create, once you leave it alone, create an incredibly diverse um, plant communities and topography and soil types and structures. So, and, and that is what creates diverse wildlife, as we, as we kind of all know. You know. So, um, it's so, 
So it's quite interesting as well. So you you uh, you talk about mentioning there about topography and how if you're altering the topography, both building up and recessing the ground, how just that small sort of nuance in topography, how that can specifically can have a massive effect on again flora and fauna as well. Yeah, yeah, because what all the topography is doing is it's giving you, you know, if you, if you if essentially if you've got a landscape that you put the same soil everywhere and you rake it flat, you're going to basically the vegetation is going to want to be the same throughout the whole of that landscape, isn't it? It's going to def want to default to that. Now you can garden it and try and stop it from doing that, which is what gardening is in effect, isn't it? I mean, mm. you know, we put topsoil everywhere and then we try and grow plants that couldn't compete against the plants that like topsoil. So gardening is a process of, of stopping um, succession, really. Um, but if you can start to dictate the soils and the topography, then you can, you can actually say, right, I want this part of my landscape to, to be relatively low vegetation. I want it to be relatively sparse. And I know the plants that really like that sort of uh, habitat, and I'm gonna give them the soil and the aspect that they like. And therefore, I don't have to garden it quite so much, do I? Because it's actually wanting to be that thing. Whereas if you are kind of stuck with fertile topsoil, um, you're, you're always going to be fighting against what it wants to be, which in effect is going to be coarse grass and competitive weeds and then bramble and then scrub and then tree. So um, by altering the uh, substrates and choosing your substrates, you're kind of working with the plants and you're giving the plants what they want. And I think it's a bit like the Chateau thing, you know, right plant, right place. And I think mm -hmm. we need to think about right soil, right plant. You know, I mean, it needs to... It, it, and the opportunities then for design to design with that so you can then dictate what your plants do you can dictate what your plants do what plants are going to be happy there and you can also dictate where plants aren't going to be happy and where they're not going to grow so therefore you can dictate your spaces in the landscape mm. and it's often the space between plants isn't it that makes the landscape really work mm. um, and then once we started, I mean, this all came off the back of a, a we built a big three car garage for a customer and uh, uh, we planted it up and uh, we went back after a few years, like we often do, to see how things were going. And she'd had a, a granite fines driveway leading up to this garage that, that butted to the garage. And when we came back, see, she wasn't a gardener at all, um, but all the, the, the green roof plants that were on the roof had all seeded down off the roof into the granite driveway. Mm. And this was the most amazing landscape. And that was a kind of another, another slightly light bulb moment where I thought, well, hang on, the driveway is way more interesting than the, than the flower borders. <laughs> and, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. And, soon, and it was that kind of flip on your head, you know, the paths were more interested than the borders. And, uh, um, and and also they were not only more interesting, but she hadn't done anything to them either. She hadn't gardened them, so the, the maintenance obviously was reduced as well. Yeah. Um, so that was that was the kind of key thing. And then once you start dabbling around in what materials you can grow plants in, it's uh, it's endless. You know, I mean, we have about we must have about fifteen different mat materials here, including nearly every sort of construction waste material. Um, and, and loads of local sands and building sands and lots of other crushed uh, waste materials. So, uh, and, and once you start putting that down and seeing what grows, and, and, and it, it's really fascinating. And, and, and that's, that's, only from, um, that's only from a plant perspective. You know, I mean, once you start opening the, the topography up to looking at insect habitat and breeding space for invertebrates, then of course you, you then, you can then dictate what invertebrates you'd like to bring in, you know, what sand of what solitary bees like, for instance, you know, mm. and then we're finding out now what particular sands that, that what particular bees like, um, and, uh, and what sort of rubble size, for instance, we're just finding we're getting bumblebee nesting in, in large pieces of rubble now. So if we pile loads, big piles of rubble, if they're big pieces of rubble, well, there's loads of voids in there. And, bumblebees are starting to nest in there now so that, that, that i mean you know amazing and and, sh and uh crushed pure crushed brick and concrete for instance you can create shingle in effect so yeah. you've got like an urban dungeonesque going on because <laughs> the plants don't care the plants don't seem to care whether it's a 
a beach pebble or whether it's a, a smashed up piece of concrete and brick. You know what I mean? So there's all those kind of possibilities. So it's quite interesting. So going going back a um, going back a couple of steps. So um, I think what I got from the first your first part of your answer is you know perhaps as architects, uh, perhaps as landscape architects, that we be need to begin to just think about our substrates in a different way, and perhaps the go to you know the go to specification is BS five eight you know the the BS down there for for yeah. your you know your sandy loam tops or done put it in specific specification done but i guess the message you're trying to put across is perhaps in certain areas perhaps for food production perhaps under you know lawns or whatever make yeah specify that but let's just not go for, let's, let's just not go for the default uh, soils and be thinking about the substrate in a lot of different ways yeah i mean i'm not suggesting in any way that we take, you know, we, we suddenly go into a garden, take all the topsoil away and, and, and change it. I mean, what, what I'm very interested in is the places where the topsoil is being removed. Yeah. So highways, developments. I mean, all these places where topsoil is routinely scraped off before work starts. And in fact, a lot of domestic big landscape projects are similar, similarly. Yeah. Um, when that happens, you've already taken the topsoil off and you've put it in a corner somewhere. Then it's just, uh, uh, what I'm suggesting is it, think maybe where that topsoil is best used and it's definitely best used that it can grow in food you might want to you might have a huge maintenance budget and want an incredible herbaceous border well great you know use your topsoil there yeah, yeah. but um you don't have to use it everywhere and certainly in public space on on low maintenance budgets which is what most of the landscape is um as soon as you introduce nutrient as soon as your in, your nutrient level goes up as soon as your organic content of the soil goes up your maintenance goes up yeah. pretty much yeah. unless you, you know, unless you cover it in, in fabric and bark and all those other things yeah. um so it i i guess i'm just as the process that these things the process of taking the soil has already been done you've got massive machinery often on site on a lot of these projects it's great to think about where that stuff is best used because topsoil is an incredibly precious thing and we don't really need it everywhere yeah. uh and if you and, and and in fact of course and and you could then create incredibly diverse uh, landscapes by not using it everywhere. And because you're mixing up, again, you're mixing up the substrates on you, you're given a, a choice. And the other, I, I think the other crucial thing, not only the maintenance, but because you're using mineral soils or construction waste, you, you can then direct sow into this stuff because there, there's no, uh, there's no uh, weed bank in the soil. So mm -hmm. as soon as you take away the topsoil, you're taking away the, 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 the seed um, base. And therefore, direct sowing into this stuff. And I've, you know, I've been doing it for many years here. It is, I mean, apart from wind blown, a few wind blown weed seeds, there's yeah. no weed seeds in this stuff. So you can direct sow and you know pretty much 90% of what's coming up is what you've sown. Now that is a massive advantage, you know, because to prep topsoil, to get it in that state, as you know, probably and as any landscaper would know, and any person who's trying to create wildflower meadows or whatever they're trying to do to, to, to get the soils in, in a state good enough to direct sow is quite hard, quite yeah. difficult. Yeah. And of course, weeds are not stupid enough to all germinate at one time, again, as we know. So even if you think you've got your soil weed free in the spring, another batch of uh, weeds will come up. So I, I think the maintenance levels reduce. Um, you can direct sow, which means it's the cheapest form of landscape, isn't it? You know, you're never going to get a, a create a, a landscape any cheaper than direct sowing. Um, and your ongoing maintenance obviously is reduced because if the weeds, the weed seeds come in, obviously, maybe it doesn't mean they don't come in. It just means you have longer to pull them out. You know yeah. what I mean? They grow slower, so you have more chance to pull them out. And and the the, the mixture of, of uh, weeds that you're dealing with. Is, is much more na much narrower you know mm -hmm. in comparison to when you're dealing with the top side uh, interesting so so th th there is a there's a lot of advantage with that that's without the fact that if you introduce lower nutrient soils you generally are going to get a more diverse plant community on the whole yeah um, um, so uh it's just a fascinating subject and i think maybe because i've come through I haven't had any training in horticulture or landscape or anything else to do with our industry. Maybe 
that that means you can be slightly more you know you can think well maybe we don't have to use topsoil i mean i, I wouldn't even know what the british standard for topsoil is I, I think it's a massive advantage you haven't been indoctrinated by by some sort of college or university that you must do <laughs> well you must do it that way i think it's the best that's the way that's 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 a massive advantage i reckon well i mean you know don't get me wrong i i, I now I, you know i'm doing more talks and i'm and meeting lots more people i you, you realize you know that that kind of lack of base knowledge and especially with with uh, plant names and a lot of other stuff that that i would have had with basic horticultural training it is a bit annoying not to have that but yeah. you know it is what it is man. It is. but so but going back so we were talking about the substrates and then you um we got onto the briefly got onto the subject of you talked about bumblebees you talked about solitary bees um let's dive into that a bit more because again i think perhaps for, uh, for perhaps the uninitiated when we think about wildlife people just think about hmm, think about honeybees uh yeah, think yeah. About, the thing about butterflies um but let's dive into that a bit more because you've talked about the substrates and how again the the biodiversity of the uh, the plants it, it is increased but you were just touching on earlier about you know how many different uh, invertebrates um that are also interact with this substrate yeah i mean it's certainly if we're going to talk about solitary bees for instance i mean there's, there's a few amazing facts about solitary bees and in, in, in contrast to honeybees i mean i guess everyone thinks of a bee they think often of a honeybee which is in effect is a farmed thing yeah i mean it's you know um and it has its place i guess um but um solitary bees are just out they are our native bees there's 250 species of them and what i like about them what's amazing about them is how efficient they are at pollinating our flowers so honeybees are efficient at packing pollen onto their hind legs mm. to take it back to the hive which is great this is what they need to do right but that means that less pollen gets dumped on the next flower whereas solitary bees for, for one reason or another i don't know evolutionary wise they're just incredibly messy so they <laughs> fall into one flower and stuff the pollen gets all over them and then they just blunder into the next one and and, and so they're they're up to 200 times more efficient at pollinating flowers than honeybees so that's an incredible figure uh, and 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 uh, we we kind of lose sight of that and because they're solitary obviously people you don't notice them i didn't notice them 20 years ago mm. for sure um so they're not so glamorous they're not so so they don't give us anything right i mean mankind as it is you know we love things that we get stuff back from to me so yeah, these yeah, things yeah. fly around fly thousands of miles and then we take all their good stuff and give them a bit of sugary stuff you know i mean yeah. fine but you know what i mean so uh so 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 solitary bees are amazing and but, but the thing is with solitary bees is there's a big proportion of them they have to they won't fly miles from where they breed right and they're very short distances so in, you know, you can have as much pollen and nectar as you want in your garden, but unless you've got a breeding space, you will not get that solitary bee. That's why there's no solitary bees in the middle of arable fields, even, even if there's a bit of rape out there and there's food out in the middle of the field. They're too far from their breeding space. Yeah. So it seems to me that most urban and, and, and most urban and suburban um, areas are pretty good now, are getting better for, for pollen and nectar, yeah. I'd say. Um, what they're missing is somewhere to breed. So, you know, that's what's, I think that's what's actually the, uh, the restricted thing at the moment is, is, is the breeding space. So, so you've got two things. You've got your whole nesting bees, or your aerial nesters, and your ground nesters and solitary bees. And we all know about the whole nesters because you can buy bee hotels and you can drill holes in wood, which we obviously do. Um, and that's great. Um, but to get you know, the ground nesting bees, which is which is the, the large proportion of solitary bees, you've got to have somewhere for them to to nest. In. And they generally, this is not all, but they generally like warm, sheltered, sandy um, substrates. Yeah. Now, um, and they generally like it to be fairly sparsely vegetated. This substrate, <laughs> so they're relatively fussy. You know, that's why you tend to see them down the the sides of paths often where we've trod the path and kept the vegetation back, you often get solitary bees there. Um, so the, the whole idea of substrates and, and where we are here, we're on heavy clay where we, where we live. Um, so we, we had very, very few ground nesting bees because um, there's a few that like little nesting heavy clay, but not very many. Mm. Um, 
Now, as soon as we started dumping sand here, bearing in mind we're a mile from the sandy soil here. Uh, yeah. As soon as we started dumping sand, within months, solitary bees that we'd never seen before were, nest, were nesting. You know? So we would, no matter how many flowers we'd have grown, we'd have never got those unless we'd have provided them the green space. So again, that, that's another reason to look at substrates. So sub, substrates then, that's another dimension to soils and substrates. What breeds in them? What's happy in them? Hmm. And you can pull in, I think we're up to about 15 or 16 bee species now, solitary bee species that have come in on the back of us dumping bits of sand here that we didn't have before. So um, you, so you use, use the collective there, you said we. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, you've been working with the entomologist, it's James, isn't it? Yeah, James McGill. Yeah, we have. It was a, like, uh, if ever anything happened that's, that's changed the way we think about stuff and uh, made a massive difference since meeting James. It is just the, 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 the amazingly mad and most wonderful entomologist. I mean, just, just fantastic. And he just opened everything up. So we were sort of, I was bluffing my way through saying, oh yeah, I'm sure this is all good for biodiversity. You know, we've done this. I'm sure I've seen more bugs. And I didn't really know, of course, this is the thing. I didn't really know. Um, so as soon as James came along, we then realized where, you know, he surveyed the whole garden and we realized that the, 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 uh, the brownfield bits and the sandy bits and considering how new they are, they were actually the most biodiverse parts of my garden, even though we've got old bits of meadow and ponds and various other things. Yeah. So that was a kind of, you know, just, a, it, was, it, was, it was what we thought, but we weren't sure. Uh, and, uh, and the other wonderful thing about working with entomologists, and this is some, something I think that from a landscape architect um, or a designer's point of view, if you get hold of an entomologist, you can start to, you can start to look at what, what invertebrates there isn't in the land, that you haven't got in the landscape, or what invertebrates you want to get in the landscape, and he will tell you what they love. And then it's your job then, like and you leave, James leaves it with me. He tells me what they like, and then we think how we can bring that structure or landscape into the garden. Mm. And then James comes back to see if we've been any good at it. And uh, that's a fascinating process. And, and, and if you can get that, if you can start pushing up the levels of your invertebrates in your landscape, everything else pretty much follows on from that. So all your glamorous stuff kind of comes in on the back of invertebrates. So vertebrate sort of diversity and biomass is an incredibly good way of, of, of understanding how, how good your, your uh, landscape is for biodiversity. Because uh, I, I feel that, you know, front and centre, you know, uh, landscape architects, designers, you know, can be, you know, can be the main lead, but it's almost get, people, we need to get out of our, and I excuse the phrase, because I've heard this a thousand times, get out of our silos. So designers need to be talking to entomologists, needs to be need to be talking to hydrologists. You know, we can't just be in our little silos. No. And you know, you know, the entomologist sh perhaps should be right there, front and centre, dictating, well, not dictating, but advising on how we can truly design gardens, landscapes, developments to yeah. actually have a, like a, a dare I say, a meaningful, quantifiable sort of um, you know sort of net gain more than anything. Yeah. Well, yeah course and of course what it's it's quite bizarre that we've gone on for so long with with all these uh, you know ecologists i mean to be a good ecologist you've got to have i'd say you've got to have some understanding of horticulture and landscape mm -hmm. i would have said if you're going to recommend you know what where the where things need to go or you're going to recommend mitigation and if you're going to be a good uh, horticulturist and, and designer then you need to have a bit of ecology for sure so there, there's a there's a definitely a, a crossover and i mean it's starting to happen now in, in some high-end horticulture. I mean, all the big, big names in horticulture, I mean, Fergus Garrett, Beth Chatto, all those sort of people now are looking at the ecology and the biodiversity of, of their spaces. Mm. And they're realising, I mean, Fergus has, has been uh, lucky enough to have a, a complete survey over the last three years or so. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's incredible, the biodiversity at Dixter. Uh, and that's because, uh, this is, I, my guess anyway that obviously he's got a massive food source because he has to make the stuff look incredible there has to be there has to be flowers running from february to december or wherever um yeah. so he's got a food source beyond belief and then of course the dixter he's got that incredible um mixture of, of structure old buildings old walls steps yeah woodlands 
I mean, bits of med. I mean, he's just got that wonderful, wonderful hedges. I mean, it's, so the combination of, of high-end horticulture food source, which is massive, obviously. I mean, uh, I can't imagine invertebrates can eat. You know, there's always going to be more food than they're ever going to want. Or, yeah. or, but the, what he's done is obviously he's 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 looked at Dixter and he and he's he's just sort of I don't know what he's done. He's probably just sort of roughened the edges slightly and and given those places that are just um, given a given a chance for stuff. Um, and and he's got obviously an advantage in some respects of having old buildings, lovely old walls and things like that. Mm. So and he's nurtured that. And I think. I, I'm guessing, and you know, and, and talking to Fergus um, a few times uh, earlier in the year, and and I'm guessing it's it, it's giving him a, a real buzz now. It, on the back of horticulture. It just it, it kind of just opens up horticulture then. Isn't it? mm. Amazing. Yeah. So I think there's a you know I think there's there's drivers from all sorts of parts of our industry now, and there's drivers from and, and Beth Chatter the same. I mean they're looking at, at, at lots of. Um, uh, ecological sort of um, twist to their garden now and, and looking how they can move things into that um, area a bit more, uh, which is great. Um, so you've got, you've got pressure, or not pressure, but enthusiasm coming from that end of horticulture. Mm. Uh, and I think you, you've got, um, what we're trying to do now though is to try and, seems to me the, the, the big stuff, I mean, if we, you know, what we're doing and, and bits of landscape and, we're sort of pissing in the wind on, in, the, in, the, in the scale of things we're doing. Yeah. We've got to change highways and we've got to change what happens on muff, massive public uh, infrastructure projects. And we've got to change what happens around the edge of farmers' fields, haven't we? Really, if, we've got, if we're going to do anything. And, and, and what's been really interesting, because we've been sort of campaigning for, for uh, uh, we've got a road widening scheme on our A13 road. And uh, I didn't know anything about the procedure of, of how 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 I always work, um, but it's really amazing when you start to find out about the systems that make these things happen and how they happen. You realise this is some of it is slightly mad, slightly mad. Do you <laughs> want to do you want to sort of as a bit of a as a bit of a um, as a bit of a case study? Do you want to just give give us a bit of a, a background on the A13 because it seemed like a it seemed like an absolutely massive opportunity lost. To, to create miles and miles and miles of habitat. Yeah, well, it, it turns out, this is what we've, since I've been uh, looking at it, um, I mean, it, basically the road is what it's been widened. So it's gone from two lanes to three lanes each way. So they've pushed the embankment back. So they, they basically, all the embankment and all the scrub and the trees that were on there have obviously been just trashed and taken away. Uh, and uh, they, they just move the embankments back and then scrape the embankments back to a gradient and exposed, they pushed, took all the topsoil away first, put that in a big heap, and then they exposed this beautiful sandbag. Um, but the, 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 but um, the first thing that, that uh, we found out is that um, there's an awful lot of money and time spent by ecologists, and I guess because of law and because of legislation, they have to survey what they're going to trash a lot. Right, so you, you have to spend lots of money to find out what you're going to destroy. Now, okay, there's, a, there's an argument to that, but to be honest, the bit of mitigation work, of, you know, catching some newts, moving them to somewhere normally not very suitable, and doing all that stuff, that, I don't know, is that the best place to be spending money, right? So there's tons of money goes on that. Then when they come to recreate, uh, you know, design the new landscape, Bearing in mind, this is the, probably the biggest piece of new landscape in, in the borough yeah. now, this, this piece of land. Um, it turns out that really it's planners and engineers that design the new landscape pretty much. Mm. Um, and they, they, will grade, they will grade the embankments to a certain gradient. They will put the same amount of topsoil and they will plant in trees and shrubs generally. Um, because that's always been okay from an engineering point of view, that seems to be the way that it carries on. And of course, it's it's smoothed and raked absolutely pancake flat. Yeah. So it feels really mad to me. And there's no ecologist virtually involved in the design of the new landscape, a massive, massive landscape. Mm. Uh, it just seems really completely the wrong way around. I, I mean, it feels to me like how much money do you want to spend on a landscape that you are totally destroying? I mean, okay, you can move some newts if you want, but to be honest, the whole of this part of Essex is covered in great interesting news, to be honest. Anyway, 
as an aside, but you can move some stuff. And if there's dormice, lovely, move some dormice. But you know, it, it's quite difficult to move stuff. It's very difficult usually to find a place that's as good usually as the habitat you're destroying. Mm. So let's spend more money on designing the new landscape to be good. And if mm. we get the new landscape to be good, then it can become incredibly important to wildlife and more biodiverse than the original landscape, I'd say, really quickly, if you do it right. And um, I know there's been a few schemes, like um, Phil Sterling, for instance, is a great guy, and he's, uh, he's campaigned down in Dorset, and he managed to get the Weymouth Relief Road. He managed to stop and put in topsoil back on the chalk there. And lo and behold, that whole embankment now is covered in orchids and 20 odd butterfly species. I don't know. It's become an amazing place in 10 years yeah, yeah, yeah. and saved them some money. Anyway, now I know there's engineering issues and I understand that, you know, we've got to, but we, we should at least be talking about what the new landscape should be like, because mm. that is, that's the real potential for biodiversity. Where are we going to increase? How are we going to increase biodiversity? We're not going to increase it in old nature reserves, particularly. Okay, we can look after them and keep them the same, and they might keep the biodiversity up. The only place we're going to increase, really have a chance to increase in biodiversity generally is in new landscapes, and, and, and especially big new landscapes. Yeah. Uh, because we've got the machinery on site, we've got all the massive amount of machinery, and there's a huge budget usually. So to move things around and, and create an interesting uh, variety of topography and substrates would be so easy and so cheap but it never happens pretty much. Um, so I think we really underplay the potential of new landscape for biodiversity. We really do. I think we're, we're still a little bit in that set of, you know, we've always been brilliant in this country at preserving things and looking after nature reserves. And there's a great volunteer force that does that. And that is obviously incredibly important, but we really underestimate how good a landscape can be very quickly if it's designed correctly. I mean, you, you, you take the Barnes Wetland Center, for instance, you know, I mean, it was a deep sided reservoir, pretty much. And we just, we've made it smoother. We've, we've increased the diversity of the topography in effect. Now it's an, it's an incredibly important site. How quickly did that happen? We've got Canvey Wick down on um, Canvey Island here. Um, the third most important site for, for invertebrates in the country, in the country. And that includes all your triple SI sites and your ancient woodlands and God knows what else that's been left about 40 or 50 years, just left an industrial site. Mm. Now, I mean, you know, there's, there's tons of gravel pits, chalk pits. Where are all the, where's all the triple SIs on places like that, aren't they? You know, yeah. so I, I, I just think there is the potential to really make places amazing, to make new places amazing, there really is. And I think, you know, I think we really need to start valuing that and we really need to every piece of new landscape if we can do our best to design that in a way that's going to you know it's going to perform for biodiversity and for people obviously you know and for people you, you know there's a good aesthetic as well so so with um a part of that um part of that john uh, you know new new landscapes or parts of new landscapes is green roofs now, um, it's quite interesting, me, um, a couple of episodes ago, me and Gary Grant were putting the worlds to rights on uh, green roofs, but a lot of work you've done with, we've talked about substrates, but a lot of work you've done with substrates and, and green roofs is you really can have a, um, you know, quite an, an impact on biodiversity with, you know, with, um, with green roofs, um, because perhaps to some people, green roofs are just a bit of sedum, job done box ticked but do you want to expand do you want to expand yeah. after what you, you've been doing with green roofs yeah i mean i i think i think i think the big thing about green roofs for me and this is what's increasingly I'm, I'm beginning to think is that they're not in the southeast of england they're um they're not just a place to think about in interest in plant communities because it's quite difficult in this corner of england and it's virtually every year most of our native plants that are on green roofs are going to get, at some stage, they're going to get burnt off. You know, it's an incredibly hostile environment. So I think we know, we know, there's two things I think we should be looking at green roofs. I think we should be looking at structure on green roofs. So we should be looking at breeding space. So we, we, all our new roofs now, we're putting sand mounds on for ground nesting bees. We're putting log piles on. We're putting pieces of liner that create temporary pieces of ephemeral little ponds on. I think roofs are really useful places to create 
structure and breeding space that would be very difficult to do on the ground, especially in an urban place, because the disturbance would be too much of it, cats or whatever they'd be. So I think roofs are, I think we're missing a trick if we don't look at roofs as very much more of a structural and a breeding space and not necessarily put all the emphasis on the plant space because it's very difficult to, and unless you've got more rainfall than we have in this climate, it's quite hard to produce a continuous nectar and pollen source on a green roof. At some stage in the southeast, they will be brown, yeah. unless you irrigate them. Um, and then the other thing I think we should look at is alongside the native um, plants on roofs, which you know there's quite a few that perform pretty well, we should be looking at some plants that make sense from a climate change point of view as well, and some plants that will tolerate that level of stress because it is incredibly stressful. It's not just the drought, I think it's the, it's the temperature of the soil. There's no subsoil underneath the green roof. So I think the temperature of the soil has a big effect as well. Um, so we should be looking at some plants that can really hack it in those conditions, which, could, which would probably be some, I mean, there's loads of amazing Mediterranean plants. Turkish species we've been looking at and trialing here, um, some Californian stuff. Um, I think we should be mixing in some climate change stuff and some plants that are going to perform on a green roof amongst the natives. You know, I, I really think, mm. you know, most of these roofs that go in in urban spaces, they're not next to a triple S I site, are they? You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and if we want to keep, if we want to keep a nectar source going, we've got to have a plants that are not going to burn off completely when this, when this heat comes. Um, so I think that's a really interesting place is looking at, the potential subshrubs, for instance, there's some really interesting subshrubs from the Mediterranean areas that, um, that that would work well. So, I think we just need to open our mind up to not just be focused on the plants. I think we should look at the structure and the potential of that space to create wetland or to create rubble piles or log piles or sand piles would be. I think it's a great place to try that stuff. So, just going, so a couple of things that spring to mind that. Um, you know, this has been achieved quite well. Uh, so there's a, a green roof that was um, uh, designed by Dusty, uh, Dusty Gedge and Gary Grant on the top of the David Attenborough building in Cambridge, where I lived, where you've got yeah. some habitat up there. But yeah. perhaps for any engineer um, sort, of, sort of listening to this, in terms of the structure underneath a green roof, you don't correct me if I'm wrong, but you don't have to have a super reinforced um, roof structure to support a lot of these green roofs. Because in terms of perhaps the extra investment, it's not a massive engineering feat to to support some of these green roofs you, you've been talking about. No, I mean I, I think that the the big thing about green roofs, the usual thing is that people ring us up, and this happens a lot. They ring up and say, "Oh, I've got this. I've, I've, we've built the building. It's a green roof. I want to create this beautifully." thick meadowy style roof and I want to do this and I want to do that and then you say to them well what loading did you design the roof for and it's, mm -hmm. it's always too low so the big thing about green roofs is, is to talk about what sort of roof you want to create early days on a building and then you can design in the structure to support that easily I mean mm -hmm. to go from for instance on the small scale we do I know it's you know it, some it's different on huge buildings but not much more different I mean we if we're building a green roof and we want to put four inches of soil or we want to put eight inches of soil, we just have to jump from a, probably from a five by two to a seven by two joist. That's, that's usually the only flip, right? Now that is the same labor cost. It's the same screws and nails. It's just the material cost, which is tiny. So mm -hmm. if, if you can just think about your roof right from the start and try and design in as much loading as you can, that's, that's within your, you know, is reasonable. The more loading you can give your green roof, the more flexible you can be, the more kind of extravagant and, and interesting you can be about the design of your roof then. Do you know what I mean? If you just give yourself a bit of leeway, but as soon as you skimp on the structure, you're then gonna restrict it. Um, and uh, I think it feels to me like, you know, 150 mil of substrate would be a great sort of yardstick to go to as a, as a, as a base. Um, you know, if you, if you can design the roof to 150 mil, which is about 220 kilos a square meter, yeah. um, then, and that's pretty easy to do if you're designing the building from scratch. Uh, if you can do that, then you have got chance to do all the things we've been talking about. Do you know what I mean? You've got chance to put rubble up there. You've got chance to put a sand mine mound. You've got chance to create pollen and nectar source for much longer because the plants won't dry out so quick. You've got, it just opens up all sorts of possibilities. 
as soon yeah. as you kind of restrict yourself with a tiny amount of soil, you're limiting yourself again. And you, and potentially also you're ticking uh, quite a few biodiversity net gain uh, points as well with with the uh, with the green roofs. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I guess you would. I mean, they basically do everything, don't they? I mean, I always like to think of it. First of all, they make your roof lining last longer. Right? That's the biggest thing. That's one of the big things for me. So if you chuck a load of soil on top of your flexible rubber liner, it's going to last longer than if you left it in full sun, going from 120 degrees to minus 10 in the window. Right? Yeah. So that's the first thing to remember. They do, green roofs make roofs last longer. They don't make them last a short amount of time. And there's better insulation as well, though, isn't there? So that when, after installation, there is there is notable um, cost savings on heating of buildings. Is that correct? I guess the biggest cost saving, I'd say, for sure, would be on cooling the building, which yeah. is more relevant now as time's going on. So, so if you, I mean, it, it, it's all it's all common sense, isn't it? If you imagine, you know, going in an old, like an old Anderson shelter where they used to just chuck the soil over the top, and you go in there on a hot day, it is cool, obviously. Yeah. So. That, that, that's going to, soil on a roof is going to make it much cooler and it is going to make it warmer. The problem with the green roof is that the insulation value varies depending on how much water is in the roof. So if it's saturated, the insulation value is, is lower. If it's nice and dry and open and got lots of air, it's going to be higher. And I think they've had a job to actually fix a figure for insulation value for a green roof, but it obviously does insulate. Yeah. Um, but it most definitely cools. And I know there's been a lot of research done with air conditioning costs um, and green roofs. And that would, it makes perfect sense. And, and of course, the other big thing it does, the other lovely thing it does, is that it, it, when you get a heavy um, downpour, you know, most of the time in the summer, the water, no water comes off because it just gets soaked up in the, in the substrate. But even if it gets to that tipping point, the water coming off, stuff comes off nice and slowly and over a long period, you know what I mean? So, yeah. So your, your engineering for your drainage and everything else doesn't have to have this one in 50 year massive flood where every piece of water on tiled roofs comes off within seconds. Uh, that's the, the, the lovely thing about absorbent roofs, absorbent mm. landscapes, isn't it? You know, that stuff goes, stuff's just slowed up, you know, and uh, it takes its time. I mean, when it rains heavy on this roof, on my house that I'm sitting in now, um, you know, it could be running down the chains down pipes at the back for two, three hours after it stopped, you know, where the water is just gradually filtering through and gradually coming off. That's what you want as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a drainage engineer, that's what you want. Mm. Then you don't have to have drains the size of double decker buses, do you, to deal with a one in 50 flood, 50 year flood, you know, I mean, uh, it, it, it is common sense, isn't it? really, I guess. It is, but engineers like those big, uh, like those, uh, perhaps it's, <laughs> it's easier to perhaps get their head around, um, you know, thinking about pipe bore and, you know, and gradients rather than fluffy green roofs. But, Maybe. but, but, but we, I mean, but, um, you know, as, as part of your sort of suds train, I mean, it's, um, I mean, it, it, it's it's going to be vitally important. We're, we're getting these weather events more and more and more, and I can only I can only personally see them accelerating. Yeah. Um, so you know that one in fifty, yeah. I mean, one in 50 storm yeah. is going to be one in twenty storm. Yeah, and of course, the stronger you make your roof, the more substrate you put on your roof, the more absorbent your roof's going to be. That's the other thing. You got a little thin pissy bit of sedum up there. You know the water's going to be coming off much quicker, yeah. much quicker. So if you've got 150 mil of absorbent soil, it's going to be coming off a lot slower. Um, so that's another advantage. And of course, the longer you keep the moisture in the, in the soil on the roof, the more um, evaporation and the more cooling effect that the roof has from, a, from an urban heat island point of view as well. So the thicker the soil, you know, the, 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 the more evaporation, the longer the evaporation, so the more the cooling. I mean, it, you know, if you imagine, you know, a, 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 a thin bit of uh, a sedum with a thin bit of substrate on is going to dry out within a very short space of time mm. and then it's not going to be evaporating in the same way so so th there's a there's, it's basically got a, it, you know soil and plants on a roof have got advantages all around and if you can just create a bit more soil on a roof mm. you're going to increase those advantages I guess. yeah big time so um Perhaps the last string of your bow, you mentioned it right at the beginning of the, um, of the uh, podcast, 
is uh, the work you've done around social housing because um, you know I've watched from afar what you've been doing at um, Clapton Park. Um, do you want to just go into that because that's been a, it's been a fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that's been a uh, yeah, that's been a, a definitely has been. Like I said at the beginning, it's really been a it's, it is a privilege to look after public space, isn't it? You know what I mean? It really is. I mean, you know, where do you get a chance to actually do something that that um, you know that that many people are going to see as a as a as a gardener? You know, um, and I think that the the big thing about social housing, but well, it, it wasn't even so much. It was social housing, but it was much more about uh, maintenance or, or or caring for somewhere and and. And the value, we put so little value on actually looking after stuff. And let's be honest, we're all gardeners. Well, we're not all gardeners, but certainly we are, you are. And, and, and you know, gardening is caring, basically. That's what it's doing. And I think what's happened, especially with the funding systems and the emphasis and whether all the money's gone, the money's always going on infrastructure. Yeah. So we could, always, we could always get money for infrastructure on our estate. Could always get money to build stuff yeah. but could we get money from funders to actually pay local gardens to look after that space with the local community no we couldn't yeah. very difficult i think it's can we need a you know i think our industry needs a it needs to have, have a broader discussion you know because um you know the schemes that we put in you know it sounds dramatic but a lot of them just crash and burn yeah. Of course they do. They crash and burn, and I say that, and I'm not that crash and crash and burn is not my words. It was it's a, it's a phrase that James Hitchmo, Sheffield University, used. Yeah. His you know if his schemes yeah. crashing and burning of the man of you know is a yeah. top class you know yeah yeah individual. It, it's 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 it it is it is. I mean it, it you know it, it's just just completely fundamental to everything. Is how you're going to look after it, and we we you know when we were working with schools, for instance, you know we built loads of wildlife gardens, right? Now that's great. Everyone comes out, parents come out, the teachers come out, we build the pond, do all the stuff, right? And then maybe a year, year and a half later, there's a guy on eight pound an hour with a strimmer looking after that space. I mean, I, I'm, that's not, I know that's an extreme example, and you do get lucky sometimes. You get a parent that's really good, and we'll go and, but. There is no money spent, no emphasis spent on caring. You know, we, like on, I always used to think in, in, on the estate, we don't need probably another pergola. We don't really need a, a, the, the, the residents. I, I can say with certain amount of um, certainty certain, that uh, they would rather see gardeners caring, hand weeding, looking after space, chatting to, to, to the people that they're, they're, the people that are living there. That is where the value for money is, you know, mm. just coming in and paving an, an area over or spend, you know, you could spend, you could, you could have a, a, an amazing, incredible local gardener working with the community, I don't know, one or two days a week throughout a whole summer for the price of how many, how many square feet and metres of paving, not very many. Right. right? And, and th that is the best money, the best money spent. And it's so depressing to see all that effort and all that enthusiasm going into building a landscape and then it never gets looked after. And it, and it happens time and time and time again. So what we tried to do at Clapton Park is we thought, well, the only way we're probably gonna make this uh, happen or make it continue to happen, I mean, obviously we tried our best to look after the place and we did do a lot of interesting stuff, but we're very keen. So we, the only way we knew it was gonna continue is to try and change the contracts. It's a bit like the highways, we need to change the systems. Because yeah. unless we can change the contract, the next company that come in, I don't know, you know, they might be really, really good, but if they don't happen to have the enthusiasm and don't happen to want to spend the time with the community and, and have something in their guts about it, mm. it's not written in their contract. So they, they don't do it. So we were lucky enough to be able to write the new contract uh, and the, the residents asked us to write the new contract. So we left in March, we finished in March, and after 18 years and we wrote the new contract and um, it's um, it's ID Verdi now that are looking after the space um, and I'm, I, I haven't been back much because of what's been going on but I'm really hoping that you know what, what we've started and what's in the contract is going to continue um, and I think the other thing people have got to get away from is every time you talk to someone you know like you talk to someone about um, gardening or anything and it's always oh well it's got to be low maintenance oh yeah. You know, you're looking after the, the social housing. Oh, you're doing wildflowers. Oh, does that mean you're saving money? No, 
No, no, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. You know, it doesn't mean we're spending very much more, but it does mean we're spending a little bit more. That little bit more is giving, like, the, the wildflowers along the railings in, in, you know, we, I don't know, say 200, 300 metres of wildflower edge. You know, it costs a bit of money to do that. Not much, though. And the joy 300 metres of flowers give to people. Mm. I mean, it's not in... You can't do the, all this stuff on the cheap. Mm. And, and we need to somehow move the emphasis from always building things, always changing things, and investing in people. And the other thing is, if you invest in maintenance and caring, you invest directly into the pocket of the person that's working there, pretty much within reason. So, you know, the money's going to, to it's going into labour, isn't it? It's going into to us working and caring for things. Mm. It's not going into manufacturing all the time. And uh, I don't know. I think I think that that's a mindset change, and and it's going to be hard. But if we can do that, it, 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 people really do love seeing someone working. And and because if you if you've got a, a, a decent maintenance budget that allows you to hand weed, that allows you to do the nice things, that allows you some time to talk to people, right? And that should be written into a bloody maintenance budget. Yeah. Um, you know that. That, that that's massive value and that's what people crave that yeah but at the moment most maintenance contracts don't allow you to take ear protection off right so most most maintenance contracts you're cutting grass you're trimming hedges or you're spraying chemicals uh, you know not not all and i know there's budgets for people but the, the the core of the maintenance contract is that well you yeah. can't even hear anyone and your job is pretty shit if you've got that all that on and that's all you're doing, most people, you know, we're gardeners. We don't really want to trim hedges all day and cut grass all day. It's not really, you know, it's the other stuff that's the wonderful thing. It's the seed sowing and it's the flowers and it's, it's, mm. it's, it's the interaction with people. Uh, that's the joy of gardening, I would say, especially in public space. Um, but you're dead, right. you're dead right. Just get changing that, you know, it's, it's, these are lovely things to say, but again, it's just, if you change yeah. your contracts, it, it, incrementally you're going to change you know then it becomes you know the semi-norm it's not just 19 cuts 19 cuts per annum sprays rib but it's but it's quite interesting you're echoing um you are echoing um uh, uh, quite a few other um, quite a few other people that i spoke to um went to a conference last year where um there's a an american designer called thomas rayner and he was oh, saying yeah I'm no, saying similar yeah. things, you know, said so we have to, you know, we have to, you know, put, spend 75% of the budget, but keep 25% of the budget. So at least we can yeah. be involved with the landscape for two, three, four years. So at least yeah. you've got some sort of guidance. It's got some sort of guidance. So it's yeah. got a fighting chance of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in social housing, even more important. You know, these, these, are, these, are, these, are, these are generally often poorer areas. They're, they're often... You know, they might not be near a big park, you know, so that the bits of green space around the houses, those forgotten pieces of green mm. space, they are so important. And, and they've been totally overlooked, really, in the, in the, the, the horticultural and the, and the, jet, the bigger green space agenda, really. It's always, always been about parks. And um, those little bits of green space outside where people live, that's what they walk outside and pass every single day, you know, and small tweaks to the way you look after them completely changes things. You know, I mean, we 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 uh, made food as food uh, as as a default planting for the last six seven years. We we only use food plants. Any new planting we did, unless there was a really good reason not to. Yeah, and that was another lovely little shift. And you know, on the back of all the allotments that we'd created, we then we then shifted to the public space and and and, and made sure that uh, everything we did had a basis in in food because people really noticed that. And they notice a green space that's got an apple tree in it or a red currant or a medlar. They really notice it. And, um, and of course, they can pick the bloody stuff mm. because it's theirs, you know, it's in their public space. And, um, and there's a massive disconnect, I think, between the people living and, 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 and they don't associate this green space around them as being theirs <clears throat> and haven't done for many years. So it takes a while for people to get out. It took us a while for people to understand they could take the stuff. <laughs> so people were frightened people thought you shouldn't do it you know and it's like people thought they shouldn't pick flowers you know all the all the flowers we grew along the railings people said oh no don't they used to hit their kids don't pick them. <laughs> and, 
and uh, we used to go, no, 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 please pick the flowers, pick the flowers, because that's that. I mean, what, again, the other advantage of direct sowing is the cheapness and the and the quantity of flowers you produce. Yeah. There's plenty of flowers for everyone, isn't there? You know, so th th they are two joyous things to see people collecting food and picking flowers in public space, aren't they? You know, what what a nicer thing would you want? Yeah, too right. So, John, we've been talking just for a little over an hour, so I'm sure you've got to get on. But, John, it's been, uh, it's been lovely chatting with you. Um, and you, Dan, and you, mate. Um, so, where can people get hold of you? Uh, you know, socials, uh, websites, where can they get hold of you, John? Yeah, I, I guess uh, Twitter and Instagram probably be the best place because it's much, that's much more up to date than my website usually. So, uh, that's uh, uh, at Grassroof Co and Grassroof Co. Um, those two t on Instagram or Twitter. That's the best place, probably. Uh, uh, and uh, we do have a website of grassroofcompany.co.uk. Top man. Okay, John, thanks a lot. Cool. Nice time. to see you, Dan. Bye, mate. Bye-bye.